Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's Modern War Institute Speaker Series event with Staff Sergeant uh, retired Ryan Pitts, a Medal of Honor recipient for his actions as a platoon forward observer during the Battle of Wanat in Konar, Afghanistan in July of 2008. Um, before we get to his, his account of the tactical battle, I'm going to give you a very brief rundown of the strategic logic and operational realities that put 2nd Platoon of Chosen Company in that remote, remote base to begin with. Um, I did not know Ryan personally uh, during our deployment in 2007 and 8, but we served together in Task Force Rock, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Infantry. Um, I was a company commander for our Delta Company, and he was obviously a platoon forward observer. Two rotations prior to that, I was a planner on the division staff in Bagram. And to give you some context, that was 2005. We had about 20,000 U.S. troops. Iraq in the same year had just under 150,000. Huge economy of force mission. And to look at a way to build a sustainable, long-term Afghanistan that would deny insurgent safe havens, we decided to focus on two areas, Kabul and Kandahar. Uh, one, we knew we had to give enough time for the Afghan national security forces and government to establish themselves, so we had to protect Kabul and its environs. And two, we knew we couldn't let the Pashtun majority um, of the Taliban support reestablish in Kandahar. So that's where we focused. Made sense, probably the right thing to do, but we faced a huge strategic dilemma. And that was a porous border. In any counterinsurgency, the enemy's ability to continually resupply itself, replenish men, weapons, and equipment will undermine anything the counterinsurgency forces are doing. And we had to deal with that because the federally administered tribal area in Pakistan and a known network in Madrasa was pumping out uh, year after year radicalized fighters. So it degraded everything we were trying to do in the center of, this, of the country. Um, in 2005, we recognized that we couldn't do much about it just because of force structure. But we did plan what conventional forces in the, what was called N2KL region, that's Nuristan, Nangahar, Konar, Logman region would look like. We passed that plan off to 10th Mountain who replaced us and they launched OP Mountain Lion starting in April 2006. This was essentially a movement to contact to clear into Northeast Afghanistan and establish a foothold. Every position they had, they fought for. Uh, they established the brigade headquarters in Jalalabad. They established five battalion headquarters throughout the NK2L region, including a base at Fort Blessing in Konar, which is right here. That's where Task Force Rock fell into. That's where we fell into. And they established, and that's where I'm gonna focus on just briefly. Uh, there in Konar, we fell in on five company positions. Abel, Maine on the Pesh River for Abel Company. Battle in the Korngal. Everyone's probably seen the movie Korngal. Our chosen company, which Ryan was a part of, uh, was in co-located with the battalion headquarters. Our Delta Company, which I commanded, was along the Abad, Jabad, Hardball Road. And our headquarters uh, was in Asadabad. Those were decent bases. But below that, anything below the company level, was tiny, tiny platoon or lower outposts, which fell into two kind of flavors. In my area, it was as far as 10th Mountain could drive up valleys and just stop their vehicles. Terrible conditions. People living in their vehicles, maybe with reinforced sandbag positions to fight from. Um, the other kind of extreme was what Ryan fell in on and Chosen Company, uh, basically airlocked bases as far down the valleys as they could fly, and then just stop and establish a base on the middle of a slope, completely disconnected from everything. And Chosen had the two most northern positions in our battalion AO, which were Bella and Ranch House, both eventually closed down. Uh, these bases were completely isolated from the entire mission. They had no connection with the governance, no connection with the, internet, with the economic system, no connection with the Afghan National Security Forces. So when we fell in, and I don't, don't get me wrong, they made sense when 10th Mountain did it. 10th Mountain put them there for a reason. They were interdicting kind of known avenues through the mountains. They served a purpose. We felt as Task Force Rock, they had outlived their purpose. The enemy caught on. The enemy changed their supply routes. The enemy adapted. We were fixed. We were fixed in these positions. So we took most of the deployment looking at how we could reorganize this battle space to better match the realities on the ground and our strategic objectives. And that's how uh, really Ryan ended up in Wanat, and that's how that platoon got there. Uh, we decided that 
And it, it was a contentious decision, and it's one that has been under some scrutiny in the past. Um, I will tell you, I heard the battalion commander about a month before the decision to move got questioned on why are you doing this at the end of the deployment. He, he went in in the final month that the 173rd redeployed. And some thought that it was too risky. I will tell you that the battalion commander understood the risk. And he said, it doesn't matter. Task Force Rock is not going home without completing this mission. Because this was not a last minute good idea. This took 10 months of planning at the battalion and at the brigade level to make this move happen. It took months of negotiating where the actual base would be. It took months of negotiating how we legally pay for it through the Ministry of Interior, because we were well beyond the point of just occupying by force. It took months and many recons with the Afghan National Security Forces to get them to buy into occupying this with us. And our battalion commander knew that the unit replacing us would not have the organizational knowledge or relationships to make this happen when they assume command, or maybe ever. Uh, so he said, we're doing it. And he did one of the hardest things I think any commander could do. He assumed risk, fully understanding it for his unit, because he believed this operation was necessary to the mission and to the troops coming in behind us. Um, and that decision had real consequences that you'll hear about today. So as you listen to Staff Sergeant Retired Ryan Pitts this afternoon, I want you to think about how that strategic logic of needing to seal the border and that operational rallies of the battlefield led to his platoon being where they were and having to do what they did. So Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts joined the Army in 2003 at the age of 17 under the delayed entry program and attended Army basic training and advanced individual training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He then went to the U.S. Army Airborne School at Fort Benning before being assigned as a radio telephone operator for 4th Battalion, 319th Field Artillery, and the 173rd Airborne Brigade at Camp Ederly, Italy. Uh, he remained there with the 2nd of the 503rd from 2006 to 2009, and while assigned with the 173rd, Ryan deployed twice to Afghanistan. His first deployment in 2005 lasted 12 months, and his final spanned the 15 months that we're talking about today, beginning in 2007. Uh, then Ryan departed active duty in 2009. His civilian education includes a Bachelor of Arts in Business from the University of New Hampshire at Manchester, and he currently resides in Nassau, New Hampshire. Uh, his military education includes U.S. Army Ranger School, Pathfinder Course, and Warrior Leader Course. Now please join me in giving Staff Sergeant Retired Ryan Pitts a warm West Point welcome. Thank you, Major Jackson. I can't in good conscience say that I am a Ranger School graduate. I wasn't, I never went. Wish I had, but I didn't do it. I can't be a liar. That was some good background there. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some more of the, the context of why we moved into Wanat. So when we first got there, we did, it was on the map, we inherited uh, Aranis Outpost and Cop Bella. Those were the uh, airlocked FOBs to the north of our Ford Operating Base, our battalion headquarters, Blessing. And to give you an idea what that was like, Aranis was built into the side of a mountain. The only way to get there with large number of forces was by air. The helicopter landing zone was the top of a building built into the side of the mountain. You couldn't land uh, a CH-47 on it. Actually, you couldn't even land a UH-60 on it. They'd kind of have to touch, touch down with wheels and hover because the wheels would break through the roof. Once you got off the HLZ, it went straight up the mountain and was a couple hundred meters to the northernmost outpost. And it was wooded all the way around. It was interlocked with US posts, manned by our guys from our first platoon, with some Afghan National Army posts, as well as the Afghan security guards. And then about probably five kilometers away, we had Cop Bella. Cop Bella was located at the bottom of a valley, uh, and it had about the size of a football field. You could fit the entire base inside a football field. And again, airlocked. Only way to reinforce it, only way to resupply it. Straight up on either side, from every side of Cop Bella. There was a, a road, a dirt road, that led from Bella out to uh, Aranis, but it would still be probably a, a 90 minute hike to try and get there maybe longer. So in August, 
We had gotten there around May, June of 2007. In August, the enemy executed a, a very complex and coordinated assault on Aranus. They attacked uh, first thing in the morning. They were able to drive the Afghan security guards. They abandoned their posts. They simultaneously hit our guard posts with RPGs. They were able to breach the perimeter. They took about half, or they breached about half of the outpost before they were held at a line with the aid station and the mortar firing pit. And all the, all the fighting positions were, they were interlocked but operating kind of independently at this point because the enemy had infiltrated about half the base. And our mortar squad leader held the line with a bunch of other guys and we were able to repel that assault. And part of that assault, they did A-10 gun runs inside the wire of the FOB. We were lucky that we didn't take any, there were no KIAs, but there were a number of wounded. In action, wounded. Uh, also, one of the northern fighting positions had collapsed on one of the soldiers, and we didn't know until afterwards that he was behind enemy lines for much of the battle. They had assaulted in through his position, and he lay covered in sandbags, wounded, uh, still had the clarity of mind to try and do some of his job. He zed out the radio, and so the enemy couldn't get their hands on a radio with ComSec in it. But that assault was, was repelled. So then the decision was made to break down Ranch House. It's too far, too exposed, not very well, not a great defensible position. And so our platoon, this was first platoon that was up there, our platoon, second platoon, went up to help close down Ranch House. After closing down Ranch House, first platoon then pulled and concentrated just at Cotbella. So there's just that one outpost to the north, and Coppell again is that base that's in the valley floor. In November of 2007, the villagers of Iranis had invited 1st Platoon up to have a village meeting. 1st Platoon executed a dismounted patrol up to Iranis, uh, had a village meeting, stayed overnight, and then prepared to leave the next day. Uh, they wanted to leave early, but the villagers, you know, wanted them to stick around, you know, hey, we want to talk to you, this stuff we want to talk to you, kind of dragged it out, dragged it out, dragged it out, until the platoon leader said, enough's enough, we're going. And they were leaving around a little, probably an hour before dusk. And as they followed this goat trail back to Cop Bella, they were, walked into a, a complex ambush. And six, six guys were killed. Some of our soldiers that were in the front of the column, they had to jump off the trail down a cliff because there was, there was no cover. Our platoon ended up going out there afterwards uh, to help recover our fallen, uh, collect sensitive items, secure the area, and then pull back to Bella. And worst possible ground you could ever fight from. Just this narrow, winding goat trail, no cover, no concealment, and then he hit them with a, probably a couple hundred guys. So after that, first platoon, we replaced first platoon at Coppella. Between Aranis and then what happened uh, in that November 9th ambush, we decided to pull them out. Our company commander made the call and we were gonna rotate in to Coppella. So our platoon rotated up to Coppella. And we were there until uh, the spring of 2008. During that time, the enemy activity started to increase. We knew that based on what had happened with Ranch House, what happened on November 9th, and the intel that we were getting, that they wanted to, they were trying to figure out a way to overrun Cop Bella. Doing different types of probing attacks. Sometimes when we get our resupplies, uh, as we'd see the, the Chinooks coming up the valley, you'd see RPGs crisscross behind. Uh, they'd take pot shots at the, at the FOB, lob rockets in. And this, this went on for, for several months. And we realized, same as with Aranis, that we needed to break down this outpost. Too isolated, wasn't getting the mission done, couldn't be reinforced. So the decision was made for a number of reasons to move to Wanat. If we're gonna break down Cop Bella, we needed to move something up the valley to provide, to deny that freedom of, of movement. Now it sounds, he talked about the Colonel Oslin making the decision to move up there at the end of our deployment, and it sounds, I've had people ask, you know, that sounds like a, a strange thing. Well, we're not done until you're home. 
the deployment's not over until you're back at your home base. And also, our platoon, 2nd platoon, had done the same thing on our previous deployment. Our last month was spent in a vehicle patrol base preparing to build another base. So not only were we having to move up there to deny the enemy freedom of movement, but it was also to set the next unit up for success, as Major Jackson said. They were coming in with uh, lesser manning. They weren't going to have the same guys. They weren't going to have the same experience that we had, that this was about providing a successful transfer of authority to the next unit and setting them up for success. It didn't matter that we had three weeks or a month to go. Like I said, you're not done until you're home. And we had been talking about this. We had done the drives up there over that year, uh, doing the site surveys. We knew the terrain somewhat. And so the decision was made, and on the morning, actually the evening of July 8th, we moved up under cover of darkness and Humvees, reached Wanat and set up right inside the village. We were right in the center of a village. It was an area, the, the main vehicle patrol base was an area about the size of, a, again, a football field. Uh, nestled in the hotel and there was a mosque along the northern perimeter, a bazaar along the eastern perimeter. And the idea was we were gonna move up to Wanat and the next morning was when Bella would break down. I think it was actually even that night. So we moved up the valley and simultaneously Bella broke down and they exfilled. Some of what was going through our heads is we knew that as Bella's breaking down, that the enemy from up there is just gonna move down the valley and try and attack us and we're not. So part of this, we brought a lot of uh, heavy armor trucks. We had a lot of heavy armor, uh, heavy weapon systems. We brought mortars. We were then in direct fire range of fob blessing with 155 millimeter howitzers. Uh, we had ISR for the first couple of days. Uh, we were going to get some of the weapon systems and guys from Cop Bella. Our company commander came out uh, after the next day, after we emplaced. A couple of things happened though. That night we moved up, a bad storm rolled through and washed out the road behind us. We had contracted for Afghan construction company to come up and help with the defense and build fortifications because we didn't have any heavy equipment and we weren't gonna do this all by hand. Well, the road had washed out and I think it was a mixture of that and then they just, they run on their own schedule that they, they never showed up. So we're digging a lot of positions by hand, trying to fill HESCOs, trying to build sandbags. The vehicle patrol base, is, those guys are using the Humvees as part of the fortifications and building around it, digging down, filling sandbags as much as they can. I was located at the observation post with eight other, eight other soldiers. The observation post wasn't technically the way that it, it doctrinally, that it, it normally would be. The thought process that went into it, we were about 100, 150 meters outside the village on this spur, uh, not very far from the vehicle patrol base. We didn't have the normal fields of view and observation points from an elevated position that most observation posts would have. But our platoon leader, Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom, was willing to trade some of that for the security of being in a position that could be reinforced. That was his line of thinking. It was a little bit more exposed. It wasn't elevated the way we wanted, but he wanted to be able to reinforce it in case we came under contact. And the way the terrain was, there was a lot of open ground outside the village and it just went straight up. It was all terraced fields and there was nothing growing in them at that time that the unit would have had to cover a lot of open ground to try and reinforce a position further out. We also didn't have the construction equipment. We were having to pull security and build our own fortifications. We wouldn't be able to build a secure enough location that far out. There was a plan to fly in, kind of like a prepackaged observation post, like, um, like those sea containers you see on ships, metal prefab. It was gonna be like a already built observation post, fortified, that we were gonna bring up. But that was supposed to come a couple days later. And so we spent the first five days every day digging in. Now this is Afghanistan in July, so it's 120 degrees. We're in full kit. We were running low on water for a good part of it because the road had washed out. There were some incidents that happened where trucks had been attacked by, had been fired on by Apaches. They were enemy trucks, but the locals that drove our water were afraid to drive up. One, for being shot by friendly forces, and two, which I think was greater, was the enemy. They thought the enemy was gonna shoot at them on their way to come get us water. So we ran 
critical on water, but still trying to build. So a lot of this time it was trying to develop you know, a work schedule that made sense. We would dig a lot early, early morning, late afternoon, do as much as we could at night when it wasn't as hot to try and preserve as much water, but also build our fortifications as quickly as possible. Up at the OP, and really it was everywhere, the ground was really hard, it was like uh, clay or packed dirt, and up at the OP there was, it was, there was slate underneath it. So first we were digging down and filling sandbags as best we could, but it became a security thing. It was just becoming too much work, and we weren't able to build fortifications as quickly. We didn't want to raid their fields that had good topsoil because we wanted to try and keep a good relation, relationship with the local. Uh, but it, that was a trade we were willing to make as time went on, and we found how hard it was going to be to dig and fortify our positions. And so we went into those fields and started filling sandbags and building up all our fortifications as quickly as possible. While this is going on, we're not 100% certain what the patterns of life are in Wenat, you know, what do the people do day to day? Who are the familiar faces that are there? Pretty much the entire time we were there, we were always being watched. And any time, for us, it was a fighting age male, it's, it's somewhat suspicious, but they don't wear uniforms, so there's not anything we can do about it. They're also, they'd work in their fields, and I would see them out there. We'd get up for stand two every morning, 30 minutes, an hour before the sun had come up, everybody would be in their positions, full battle rattle, ready to go and the people had already been working out, out in the fields. We'd been hearing reports that, you know, we're gonna get attacked. We knew, like I had mentioned, that Bella had been broken down, the enemy's gonna come down. And so we were anticipating this going out there, but it, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. You hear it every day. We never got shot at. We all thought, in my personal opinion, is we were gonna get hit in like the first three days is what I thought before we got too fortified. And on the morning of the fifth day, we had gotten up for stand two. We're all scanning our sectors. Everybody's in their positions. Everybody's in their body armor and helmets has their weapons. And we had brought a, a tow truck with us, a uh, tow missile truck. And while they were scanning, they had spotted some people moving in the mountains to the west. People don't go for hikes in Afghanistan. So this was outside that pattern of life that we knew they were, they were bad guys, they were enemy fighters. And so at that time, we were preparing to work up a fire mission. I was preparing to work up a fire mission because I was the platoon forward observer. We had an LRAS at our location. It was it's a surveillance system. It's probably about this big. Uh, season thermal, it'll laze, it'll give you a range, but it also has GPS built into it. It could give you uh, the, the coordinates at a target. And so we were, I was waiting for that to warm up. We had that at our location. And it was taking too long with the GPS. I wanted to work up the fire mission. And so I was trying to go back and forth with the, the tow crew to get some grids and get a better idea of where they are on the mountain because it's, it's hard to try and picture it because they were probably about 1,500 meters out. And all those people that we had seen working in the fields every morning weren't out that morning. I woke up and I thought that was odd, but I didn't know the patterns of life, so I thought that maybe they had, been, they had finished their work. While I'm in the process of working up this fire mission, everybody's scanning still. The battle opens up with a barrage of machine gun fire from the north, and immediately our position is rocked by rocket-propelled grenades and hand grenades. Every position. From the onset, they targeted the observation post because it was separate from the vehicle patrol base, somewhat isolated. They also targeted the trucks with the heavy weapon systems, particularly the tow missile. I think they had a, a, a local term for it. They called it the finger of God. So they knew they wanted to take out the tow missile system. So that was one of the first things they did. In that opening barrage, I'm wounded. I get thrown from one of our central fighting positions into, a, into another one. Two other guys are wounded. Sergeant Matthew Gobble was up there with me. He is concussed from a rocket propelled grenade that came in or hand grenades or both. Specialist Tyler Stafford was hit. He had pepper shrapnel all over. Matthew Phillips was preparing to fire back. All these guys, all the guys at the observation post, these are, they're all senior specialists, really. Most of them have all been there for a year. They have been in firefights before. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do. 
They stayed on their guns. They immediately returned fire at the enemy. They didn't stop to check for casualties because the first thing that they had to do was security. So Matthew Phillips is returning fire. He's preparing to throw a hand grenade and he's killed by an incoming rocket propelled grenade. Gunner's Willing was killed in the, in the opening minutes. So immediately a position that had nine people, two NCOs and seven senior specialists has now had two casualties, two KIAs, and three are wounded, including both the leaders. And it kind of falls on the guys in the fighting positions to do their jobs, to lead themselves. And this is happening all over. I mean, the tow missile truck exploded. That crew stayed in there until the last possible minute, until after the truck caught on fire before they exited that vehicle. And some of what was happening is every position was kind of isolated by fire. Where the vehicle patrol base was, it was all open. So there wasn't a whole lot of movement from truck to truck. Teams stayed in their trucks and returned fire. The guys on the heavy weapon systems stayed on those heavy weapon systems. Bullets were falling like raindrops. I've gone back and seen some of the pictures of the, the transparent armor that was on some of the, um, on some of the turrets and it looks like just spider webbed. Like as if like when your windshield breaks because they had taken so many rounds. So I, I, I'm wounded, I get thrown into that position. I'm disoriented. I don't really know what's going on. I'm partially in shock because I've been hit. I took shrapnel to, to both my legs. I had taken shrapnel through the back of my left boot. Uh, it had partially severed my Achilles. I had taken some shrapnel inside uh, my inner thigh. I had shrapnel in my arm, some in my forehead, left hip. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I can hear all our guys firing back, but I can't move my legs. I'm looking down at my legs, and I'm just, you know, move. And I couldn't, I couldn't move my feet. I couldn't do any of it. My leg, they were in shock. And it took me a minute to, I don't know how long I sat there. It could have been 30 seconds, it could have been five minutes. And I knew that I needed a tourniquet, but I knew that I couldn't do it myself. Because we did a lot of cross-training in our unit. Everybody learned how to stick an IV, do a needle chest decompression, do a sucking chest wound, how to put on a tourniquet. Everybody carried their medical kits in the same exact location. Everybody knew that the medical kit you carried was to treat you. You would never open your medical kit to treat somebody else, you would open their kit. You'd use yours afterwards. And so I crawled from that position to the, the southern position. And again, I can hear, I gotta drive this home. These guys are all doing their jobs. Jason Bogar is standing up and he's returning fire with the saw to the southeast. And he turns around, he stops just because I got there and he can see me bleeding, I'm covered in blood. And he asked what he needs to do and I told him to put a tourniquet on my leg. He puts a tourniquet on my leg and then he turns around and he goes right back to the fight. You see, if he was ever scared or overwhelmed, I never saw it. It was, all about, it was all about business. It's around this time, I can see Gobbles in there, he's, he's shaken, that Special Stafford crawls into that fighting position and tells me that Phillips has been killed, Zwilling's been killed, and he thinks that they're throwing hand grenades. I'd never been in a fight. I'd been in a lot of other firefights for my first deployment, we had been in firefights on that deployment, but I'd never, we had never had casualties, I'd never been in a fight where casualties had to fight. It was always, stay there, get treated, we'll get you out of here as soon as we can. This was different. When Stafford came in and said that, and the amount of fire that was coming in, it was, if you were wounded and you could still pull some weight, you needed to do it. Because it was gonna take everybody fighting to get us out of there, and even then, that wasn't guaranteed. So when Stafford told me that they were throwing hand grenades, that pissed me off. Because that meant that they came in close, and to me, that, that was personal that they thought that they could come in that close like that. But it also told me that if we were within hand grenade range for them, they were within hand grenade range for us. And so I crawled back to the northern fighting position and I started to throw grenades around our northern perimeter. And at our northern perimeter, there was a draw that ran east-west. It was a little bit of dead space in there. We had tried to negate that with concertina wire. We thought one of our, one of our posts could kind of see up that draw a little bit. We would check it at night and things like that. But that's where they had moved into. Now it was only five meters away on one side and then as it moved kind of northeast, it would probably go out, walked out to probably about 15 meters to get into that draw. I knew that I didn't want to give the enemy the opportunity to throw the grenades back in, so I started, I cooked off grenades. On the, four, on the five meter side, I started cooking them off for four seconds. 
and then I throw it and then work it all the way up to the 15 meter part. Now I can tell you, I never ever cooked off a live hand grenade. I don't even think I had thrown a live hand grenade since basic training. The only grenade I ever cooked off was a dummy grenade on the grenade obstacle course when clearing a bunker. That was four years, more than four years before. But it all came back to that, those fundamentals of training. So I threw grenades. I didn't want to use all the grenades that we had. And so there was a 240 machine gun in that position. The next thing I wanted to do was get on the 240. Also, before all this, I was talking to our commander, Captain Meyer, and we're talking about firing pre-planned targets that we had. I couldn't really do my job as a forward observer at that point in time, though. I couldn't really get up. I couldn't observe rounds. We could just call in rounds on where I thought they were. That, and I felt like the fight meant that I needed to shoot back right now was more important than me trying to, to call in rounds because we could shoot. I mean, they were everywhere. They had us 360 degrees, elevated positions. They were in as close as five meters to our positions. And so, next thing, I want to save some grenades. And all it is the entire time, I'm just trying to think of what is the next thing that I can do to help out. And so the 240 is there. And I can't stand, but I pull myself up, kind of kneeling on both knees. And then I take my hands and I put my right leg up into like a lunge. And then what I did is I would blind fire over the top of the sandbags with the 240 to try and suppress them if they were in that draw and they were right there. And then I would pop up and try and start engaging some targets. But it's a cruise serve weapon, the ammo was in a bag, and it would jam every so often. So I'd have to repeat this process, pull it down, clear the malfunction, pull some more ammo out, blind fire, repeat, and we're doing this over and over again. So I communicated to Captain Meyer the casualties we were taking, who we had wounded, the guys were, guys were killed. This whole time, I'm the senior leader up there, and still, I'm not having to tell anybody to do anything. There wasn't any time. So I'm continuing to fire the 240, and after some time I'm doing this, all of a sudden, a head pops up next to me over the sandbags, and it's our platoon leader, Lieutenant John the Brostrom. He scared the hell out of me. He looked like, it's like one of those whack-a-mole games. He just popped up with his big grin on his face. It's like, what's up, Sergeant Pitts? I really know how to answer that. <laughs> but he had, I was so relieved that he was there. We had so much respect for Lieutenant Brostrom. He, uh, I was talking about him earlier. He was a strong ranger. But he was so tactically sound. We loved him. When we operated out of Bella, and Bella was in the, the, the base of the valley, we do all these missions, and he, you know, first thing, we're going straight up. We're going to climb for an hour and a half. We're going to leave under cover of darkness. Nobody will know. We're not even going to tell the F. We don't want the security guards or anybody knowing so they can share information with the enemy. We're going to go straight up, and then we'll walk out. It was harder. There were easier ways to do things, but he always chose the hard right over the easy wrong. It was always about trying to execute on the mission and take care of the soldiers in his care. So not only am I relieved that it's him, but that there was somebody else to help take charge of the fight and help manage the fight. And that's what he did. And I didn't realize that he had brought somebody with him. Now, as I mentioned, the observation post was about 100, 150 meters away from the vehicle patrol base. You, they had to run over open ground in front of some of the buildings that the enemy was in to get to the observation post. So he was at the, at the headquarters uh, fighting position with our company commander, Captain Matt Meyer. And he told him, hey, sir, I got to go. Captain Meyer said, yep, you go do what you got to do. He ran to our second squad's position and asked for volunteers. And Corporal Jason Hovader volunteered to go with him. Now, I was always impressed with Hovader. He could openly admit to the platoon that he was afraid of dying. I, to me, that took a lot of courage, being in this infantry unit, we're at war, and you can admit that you're scared. But that kid, every time we went out, every time we got in a fight, he was right there shoulder to shoulder with everybody else shooting right back. And I would take him anywhere. And so he volunteered to go, and he and Brostrom made this crazy run from the vehicle patrol base to the observation post. I have no idea 
how they made it there. I, the only thing that I can think of it was like uh, Lieutenant Spears' run in Band of Brothers when he runs right past the Nazis in the middle of uh, Bastogne. I, I, don't, I really don't know how he made it. So he starts organizing the fight. There's another soldier up there, Rainey, Pruitt Rainey, tells me he needs the 240. So I, I, I'm, whatever Lieutenant Brostrom says, I'm cool with. And so I give up the 240. He gives me an M4 with a 203 grenade launcher. And now with Lieutenant Brostrom, man in the fight, it's time for me to get back on the radio and start talking with Captain Meyer, start trying to get different targets, trying to bring on 60 millimeter mortars. And there's a lot of different things going on in my head. We have support from the 155s. Well, we can only bring those in so close. I only want to bring them in so close. All right, so I'm, I'm thinking, and we're both thinking together, we're on the same page of let's use that for the targets that are further out where we think they might be, because it's still hard to see them. You know, they're shooting at you, you're not able to stand up and stare back and, oh, okay, they're there. But we had a 120 millimeter mortar there and we had a 60 millimeter mortar. And those guys are trying to do their jobs in the mortar pit. They're fighting from the mortar pit and trying to, to lob rounds. So at this point, I'm trying to think, I know the 60, we can walk that in real close. Minimum safe distance, safe distance, 200 meters. I would have been comfortable with the team that we had walking it into like 30. Because that's what the situation required. And they were that good. That was the trust that we had built up. We had shot so many missions together. I knew those guys that they could do it. And so I'm talking with, with Captain Meyer. After some time, I'm sitting there, and it sounds like the observation post is quiet. There's no fire going out. And I don't want to yell out because I don't want to let the enemy know that I'm the only one there. If I am the only one there, that I'm the only one still left alive there. And so I crawled around and I crawl out of the position I am, I'm heading south, and I look down to a terrace below and all I can see are bodies. None of them are moving. And I crawl further south and I look into this position that we had to the east that was up a terrace that we called the crow's nest and nobody's moving in there. And I get to the southern position, and nobody's there. And at this point, I realize that I'm alone. And I'm terrified. Because I'm hurt. I can't leave. I can't even stand up. There's not, I don't think that I can put up much of a fight. And I can hear the enemy talking around our position. And so I crawl back to where I came from, and I get on the radio, and I whisper, and I call down to Captain Meyer. And I call anybody. We all know who's on the net. So I call for Chosen 6, 2-5, or 2-6 Romeo because I know they're all going to be in the same area. I'm either trying to get the company commander, the platoon sergeant, or the platoon RTO because I know they're going to be co-located. And I need to talk to the company commander. And so I tell him, he comes on the radio, and I say, hey, sir, you know, everybody's either dead or gone up here. He tells me there's no one that he can't send anybody. Calmly. And while I'm talking over the radio, the guys down at the base can hear the enemy over my radio on our end. Now that was a difficult decision that Captain Meyer had to make. And I have never resented him for that. That is part of the burden of command. He has to make decisions about the battle and about the entire team. And the team and the mission is bigger than any one individual. And he made the right decision. And I really don't resent him. For, I mean, he's been, he's been to my wedding. He's visited my house. I respect that he made that decision and I hope that he'd make it again. But he tells me that nobody's coming. And so at that point, I know it's going to happen. To me, I knew I was going to die. And I accepted it. Quickly, somehow. It was just fact. And it was almost calming. Because then it, it kind of cleared my mind of there's only you know, one thing left I can do, and that's fight to the death. And so I sat there in the northern fighting position with my back against the east wall waiting for them to come over the sandbags and I just, I just set a goal that they're not taking me alive. They had tried previously in October of 2007 to try and take one of the team leaders from Battle Company that was in the Korrigal. They tried to take him, drag him off alive. And I knew that I didn't want that to happen. Part of it for me is I didn't want my family to see my head cut off on YouTube. I'd rather die fighting. And so I just resigned that I was just going to try and take three of them before they got me. And I sat there. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting. And then I just started trying to think of 
Okay, what's the next thing I can do? What are the resources that I have around me? What's going on? So they had given me a 203 grenade launcher. And I had seen our first squad practice shooting it indirectly, kind of aiming it up like a mortar to drop it into dead space. I had never done it before, but I thought I'd give it a try. <laughs> I just sat, I sat in the position and I put the, the butt stock on my lap and then I'd, I'd rack around and what I did is I pointed it straight up and I wanted to put them in that draw that ran east-west that was about five, 10 meters to the north. And so I pointed it straight up, moved it a hair and fired. Kind of kicked myself in the butt a little bit afterwards because I panicked for a second. I didn't check to see what the wind was doing. I didn't want that round to come back in. <laughs> now, I, don't, I have no idea if those were even effective, but it felt good doing something. <laughs> and so I, I shot a couple rounds, and then I knew I wanted to save some, and it started to become, you know, what's the, what's the next thing I can do? Right? I knew our first squad could see our position. And so I called down there, and again, you know, this situational awareness. We knew who was at every position. You know, we had been together for a, a long time. New voices, I mean, we could pick each other out in the dark just by the silhouette, the way it walked. And I called down to first squad and I knew my buddy, Brian Hissong was down there. And I told him, hey, if you can see, can you see my position? Yeah, Roger, all right, I need you to shoot over the top of the sandbags. And so I had him lay down suppressive fire over the top of the sandbags to keep the enemy from coming over. So I'm, I'm feeling, better at this point because he could see my position. Hopefully we're keeping the enemy back a little bit. It's still hell on the ground. There's a truck, tow trucks burning down on the fob. There's still explosions everywhere. And all of a sudden I, I hear more voices again and start to panic a little bit, but then I make out that they're American voices. What had happened is Jacob Soames was with third squad down at the vehicle patrol base and he had heard my call over the radio. He's a specialist. And he started saying, he started going to his team leader, squad leader, Sergeant Garcia, and was like, we gotta go, we gotta go. Like, you're not talking me out of this, we gotta get up there. Pitts needs us. And so Garcia and Soans made a dash from the vehicle patrol base to first squad's position that was just south of the observation post, about 75 meters down some terraces. There they link up with Sergeant Son Sean Samaru and Mike Denton. And together they move up to the southern end of the observation post. Sergeant Sam could see a guy standing on the, on the rock and he drops that guy off the rock and then they move into the observation post. I have never been so relieved in my entire life. Stones come in, Stones and Garcia start treating me. Garcia's pulling security, Stones is trying to, trying to treat my wounds. Denton and Sam, at this point in the battle, we've been fighting for almost 80 minutes. We're running low on ammo. Denton and Samaru start searching our guys for ammo. They start searching our casualties. This has always stuck with me. I didn't see it happen, but I, I, heard, I learned about it afterwards that Mike Denton searched Jason Hovader's body. Jason Hovader was his best friend. He searched his best friend's body for ammo, whatever he could scavenge. He told him he loved him, and then he turned around and went to the next guy to search the next guy. I, that he had the clarity to see his dead best friend and still know what he had to do and turn around and keep doing it. And so him and Sam are doing that. And around this time, the, we know the Apaches are gonna be coming up. We should be getting Apaches here soon. And I'm talking with Captain Meyer again and we're figuring out where we wanna have the Apaches come in and attack first. And I'm still worried about that draw, those guys to the five, 10 meters to the north. So we're talking to Captain Meyer and I want the Apaches to come in, in that draw, come west to east, and shoot. Now what's going through my head is I'm okay, we had done so many missions with the Apaches that you kind of get like this familiarity, that we knew all the pilots were just incredible, and that I trusted them to do that, and the situation also necessitated it. And I also was thinking of, I gotta think about, okay, which way are they gonna come in? I want them to go west to east because they'll go away from the vehicle patrol base and away from the observation post. Well, while Soans is treating me and Sam Roo and Denton are searching bodies and Garcia, there's another volley of our rocket propelled grenades that come in. They wound Soans, it wounds Sam Roo, it wounds Denton, and Garcia is mortally wounded. 
we collect ourselves in the southern fighting position as, as best we can. And Denton's the only one that can stand up. And this kid, he, he's right-handed. And he had a squad automatic weapon. What happened is he got peppered on his legs. He took shrapnel in his, I think, his left hip. And he had taken a piece of shrapnel through his right hand and the bone's sticking out. And he's standing up in that southern fighting position with his saw resting on, on his right forearm, shooting it left-handed. Because he just knew he's the only one that could stand up. He's got to keep pulling security. We've got to keep doing it. And around this time, the Apaches show up and they start engaging the enemy. And you can kind of feel the tide turning a little bit, that we're getting fire superiority and they're holding them back. Sergeant Sam makes the decision that we can't stay there anymore. We've got we to get out of there. So we knock down the southern wall and start kind of pouring out of the, the OP. And we're just right outside. And the medevacs show up. And guys start coming up from the observation post and getting to us. And they had told us to, to pop smoke to mark for the medevac. And I think we're just marking our position. There's no way that they're going to land in these terraces by us that are between us and the enemy. And they did. This medevac helicopter comes in, totally exposed, right between us and the enemy, and touches down. And then, to, further, to my further astonishment, the medevac crews get off the bird to start helping guys get on. They load me up, and that was the end of the battle for me. But it went on. As soon as the Apaches broke station, the enemy picked up the fire again. Okay. And the battle went on for hours after that. More casualties were taken at the, at, at the OP. At the end of the day, we lost nine guys. Sergio Abad, Jonathan Ayers, Jason Bogar, Jonathan Brostrom, Israel Garcia, Jason Hovader, Matthew Phillips, Pruitt Rainey, and Gunners Willing. Those guys fought to the death, to their last breath. Ayers had been operating the 240 from the crow's nest. He had taken a round in the helmet, and it, 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 the helmet had stopped it. And then he got back on the gun. And he got back on the gun, I'm sure, knowing that it could have cost him his life. And it did. But that was his duty. Bogar saved my life. He put a tourniquet on my leg. Brostrom and Hovader made that mad dash from the vehicle patrol base. There was valor everywhere that day. This is not mine. I did not give any more than anybody else. The real heroes are the guys that didn't come home. We, we carried that day together. And what it was about is about training. All the things that we did came back to how we trained. Everything we did leading up to that, how we trained in combat, how we trained before we went. I like what Sergeant Major Daly said that you know, wars are won between 6.30 and 8 in the morning during PT hours. And then they're won in training. They're won in, they're won in training areas. And it's hard. It's hard with training to, to keep that discipline to think that this is going to be real. That when you're playing war games with Miles gear on or dice gear, whatever it is, high speed stuff you guys have now, to take that seriously, that the Op 4, that the, you can, you know, you're going to reset, oh, we can pause X. Well, there's no pause in war, right? Take the training seriously. Take every opportunity you can to cross train. You're going to be future platoon leaders. Make sure your guys. Your men and women are cross-training, learning each other's jobs. That's your, that's your responsibility. Train every day to win. So. Thank you. All right, we don't have very long, but if you, do we have any questions? Is Staff Sergeant Retired Pitts is willing to answer a few in the couple minutes we have left. Nothing's off limits. Any 
it's, it's unusual to silence a crowd, and I think this is just a testimony to how powerful your story is that uh, the cadets just need time to reflect and think about it. So if there aren't any, we don't need to force it. Uh, the session's pretty much over, and obviously such a compelling story of, you know, like he said, not only his own, but just every soldier that you're going to go out and lead, and they're going to look to you. He was put in a unique position, and he lived up to every measure of it, but they all have that in them. So respect your soldiers, respect their sacrifice, respect everything they do, and do everything you can now to prepare yourself to be the leader that American sons and daughters deserve. And with that, one more round of applause and we'll end it there.